what a wonderful morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about things that we've just been doing over the last three years, not a, a long career's worth of things. But I think the message that I got from this morning is that it's very hard to plan ahead what's going to happen. When you're exploring beyond the natural world, of course, in the natural world, those explorations can take you in directions you wouldn't know. But now imagine going on to explore beyond the natural world, which is what we heard about in Bob Langer's talk. I'm going to talk about it at the molecular level, using evolution as a tool to create things that perhaps nature has not made, but that also would solve human problems. So I'll be talking about bringing new chemistry into life. And you might think, oh, gee, isn't there enough chemistry that life is busy enough? I will argue that human chemists have been pretty clever. And it would be marvelous to be able to genetically encode some of the extremely creative things that human chemists have done. So yes, bar the doors, I'm going to really bring in some chemistry here, but I'll try to give a feeling for how we can do this in the laboratory and make things that nature has never made. Now, I, I uh, started off as a mechanical engineer. I actually have my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, and I worked in the early solar energy research, research institute when Carter was president. My country actually had a national goal of 20% renewable energy by the year 2000. Sad that we didn't stick to that. A change of administration caused me to rethink my plans in solar energy and go to graduate school in chemical engineering. I picked up a little bit of chemistry then. At the beginning of the DNA revolution, what an exciting time to be at Berkeley when these brand new companies like Genentech and Chiron and Amgen were just popping up, believing that we could manipulate the biological world at the level of the DNA. As a chemical engineer who didn't want to work in the oil industry, Bob, we share that, and no longer wanted to work in the non-existent solar industry, it was clear that a whole new way of making materials and chemicals that we need in our daily lives would be enabled by the ability to rewrite the code of life. And I'm impressed by biology because biology knows how to take materials and energy from the environment and convert it into very complex biological molecules, more organisms. But if we could rewrite the code of life, we could look at an organism like a yeast or a bacterium as a, as a new chemical factory, using renewable resources and converting those into what we need in our daily lives. The ultimate programmable green chemical synthesis machine. That's a, that's a vision that has been going on for 25 years. It's just starting to make waves because it's very hard to compete with pumping oil out of the ground. And we have to be able to do that if we want to see a sustainable way of making fuels and chemicals and materials. We have to be able to compete. What does that mean? That means you have to compose this DNA so well. And you're subverting three billion years of evolution that says make more microbes, make more microbes, make more microbes, and instead have a microbe make the chemicals that you want. So it's actually a very difficult problem. And of course, my colleagues at Caltech, who are pretty good chemists, say, oh, Francis, you know, biology is great, has lots of interest in chemistry, but it cannot do what I can do. And the industry is based on my chemistry, not biology. And that's really true. Biology can't do some of the things that human chemists have come up. So when I took biochemistry for the first time, I said, I want to be a protein engineer, because these are the most beautiful molecules and so well designed to do chemistry better than any human, I would like to be able to engineer whole new proteins. Where's Jack? Jack, proteins won, right? <laughs> that, I mean, when it comes to catalysis, there's nothing to beat an enzyme. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to be able to genetically encode the chemistry that has been invented by human beings. And not only that, I want to go well beyond where human beings have been able to go and do it in a sustainable fashion. Now, this is kind of a hard thing to do. 
And the so-called enzyme design problem has been around since, and it was formulated, the question was formulated, how do you design a catalyst that does not exist in nature for many years? And it's stymied by two major problems. Here we want to rewrite the code of life, compose the DNA that will encode a protein that does something interesting. Only there's two students solve these problems and you will do a lot of good, but they're very difficult problems. The folding problem, how does the sequence encode a folded protein? We're making good headway in that one, but in fact, that's not even the problem anybody cares about in my business, because the problem that we all care about is how does sequence encode function? And remember, function that's good enough to compete with pumping oil out of the ground. That's a level of function that really has a very high bar. And unfortunately, people said, oh, you know, 30 years ago that they would have this problem solved in five years. It hasn't been solved. So if I wanted to make some headway in this, when I started out being a protein engineer 30 years ago, I had to do it differently. I had to take a route that was not the, the generally used route, which was get a crystal structure of your protein and use your big brain to identify where you were going to make changes, make those changes, spend two months, and then find out it doesn't work. And you could go through many PhD theses times to find nothing that was better than what you started with. So here, I'm gonna set up the rest of the day for you. The technology in molecular biology has progressed so much in those 30 years, and you're gonna hear amazing talks this afternoon, that you can synthesize in the test tube any DNA you want. You can type your sequence into your computer, email it off to your favorite supplier, and you will get in the mail a few days later the actual DNA. It's amazing. But the problem is that nobody knows how to compose the DNA. Three billion years of evolution gave us catalysts that you can scrape off the bottom of your shoe that are better than anything a human can design. So I am the composer. Jennifer and Emmanuel are the master editors and the synthesizer you'll hear from Dan Gibson. So all these pieces have to come together to rewrite the code of life. So let's talk about the composer. Nobody knows how to compose except for one important process. We would not be here unless evolution did a very good job at making all those wonderful proteins that we can enjoy and that we can use and that we can hope to make better. So this process, if you just go and you look at the sequences of enzymes, these biological catalysts that exist today, you can build family trees. You can build genealogies of these sequences and realize that they came from a common ancestor and through a process of mutation and selection, this simple algorithm of evolution created all of these related proteins that are all beautifully tuned, that really can compete with pumping oil out of the ground when it comes to the solving the problem of being alive. And that's a kind of an important problem. Jack's working on that problem. But nature figured it out, and let's use this design algorithm to go forward. This is not a new idea. I want to use evolution as a forward engineering algorithm mixed with these new tools of molecular biology but if you look at what humans have been doing, we have been manipulating, rewriting the code of life for thousands of years by choosing who goes on to parent the next generation. We've been making corn, carrier pigeons, lab rats, racehorses, you name it, we have been manipulating the biological world at the level of DNA to solve human problems, such as how do you feed a population and have time left over to sit and do science? or to make things that are not remotely natural. This is not a natural object. It would not be here without the intervention of human beings. And in fact, if that was released in the wild, it probably would be eaten, like many of the things that I make. But we have been using this process of breeding at the molecular level without, um, without really understanding uh, all the details of how sequence and codes function. Now, of course, this is limited in human breeding and in the biological world. If you look at the process of evolution, 
the sequence diversity that you can work with is limited. So worms with worms, monkeys with monkeys, but you don't cross the two. And you can control your rate of random mutations by taking more airplane flights or smoking a few more cigarettes, but you don't really, can't really dial in a level of mutation that you might want to do. But remember, <laughs> I said you can make any sequence you want, right? So if you can make any sequence you want, you could practice molecular breeding, you could practice evolution by choosing three parents or 33 parents. And you can dial in a level of mutation that you control. You become the breeder of molecules and have much more control, for good or for bad, over this process. This is a little bit scary in the sense that we don't know the rules. This is completely new exploration, and we don't really know the rules. And you can think of this, you know, when you think about it, it's actually a really hard problem. Because imagine just a single protein, a few hundred amino acids long, you've got 20 amino acids to work with. That's a really big space of possible sequences. There's room for you and me and everybody else in this space. It's bigger than the number of particles in the universe. It's bigger than the United States national debt. <laughs> it's a really big number. And it's mostly empty. Most of those sequences don't encode anything that solves a human problem, and they certainly don't compete with pumping oil out of the ground. So how do you search a space of enzymes that's bigger than you can even begin to comprehend and mostly empty? It's a difficult optimization problem, unless you think a little bit. Because when you, when, we, when you don't know the shape of this optimization landscape, it becomes an optimization problem where we don't know the shape of the landscape. If the landscape's smooth, then you just do a random uphill walk and you can go to the top. But if it's very rugged, every time you make a mutation, you would fall off of a peak. Now, I bet you can think a little bit about what this landscape really should look like. And John Maynard Smith did that back in 1970 in my favorite one-page nature paper. And this was before all those sequences were available and we can see how nature does evolution. He said, I think it has to look more like this, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? Every mutation you accumulated in your protein would kill you. Some do, but most do not. And so that we wander around in these fitness landscapes accumulating mutations, and proteins do that too. And sometimes they don't hurt you. In fact, a lot of times they don't hurt you, and sometimes they make you better. So this is what we argued that the fitness landscape should look like, that it's mostly empty, yes, but nature has given you these existing proteins that are already occupying places in the landscape that are rich in function. What does that mean? That means you've, if you make mutations to existing proteins, you can hope to make it better for something new. All right, so implementing this in the laboratory is really very simple. You can do it in your high school laboratory. You can copy the DNA that encodes a protein that nature gave you on the silver platter or you scrape from the bottom of your shoe. It's very easy to make lots of copies of that and control the level of mutation. You can recombine it, you can mutate it. Cells do the hard work because you've put that DNA into microbes and they start reading it as if it were its own. And we're gonna hear more about that. But they'll now make uh, proteins that have random mutations in them. And you, as the human breeder of molecules, decide who goes on to parent the next generation. That's called good old-fashioned analytical chemistry. You, d you measure the function of the protein, see who does it better. You really don't have to look at large numbers of things. Most mutations don't improve it. But if you've asked the right kind of question, that means something that you can, an improvement you can measure that would come from a small number of mutations really only one at a time. You have to be able to carefully measure that. And then you can iterate on this process in a random uphill walk to optimize for a new, for a new uh, evolved uh, feature. So I'm gonna summarize the work that lots of people have done in this field before I tell you the new stuff. Proteins adapt very quickly by this process. It's amazing how well it works. Just a stupid, it's the stupidest optimization strategy you can think of, a, a random uphill walk. 
and it uh, has generated thousands of useful new proteins that are tuned for what humans would like them to do. The scary fact, of course, is when you go back and you try to reverse engineer the product of this evolution, you find mutations, for example, that are 30 angstroms away from the active site of your enzyme. Nobody can even explain how those mutations work. And this just goes to show we're far away from solving the design problem, that is, predicting what mutation would improve activity of this, of this catalyst. We're so far away from doing that because we can't even explain them. Proteins are complicated, but evolution takes care of all of those details. But the summary is you can optimize things. Now, at this point in my talk, you should be very impatient with me because I promised you I would talk about evolution of new chemistry, not optimization of what nature has already given you. And that problem flummoxed me for a while. Enzyme, creating a new enzyme, it, that would seem like a hard problem because you have to beautifully position multiple functional groups simultaneously to catalyze a reaction. And it's an extremely difficult design problem. But it's not such a, such a, a difficult problem if you think about how nature does it. Nature does it all the time. Nature is making new enzymes as we are sitting here. And I'll just give you two quick examples. We dump potent herbicides into the natural environment, and we think for a while that they're non-biodegradable, and then boom, something happens, and some organism has found out that if it eats atrazine, if it dechlorinates it, removes this chlorine atom, it has a really nice, rich nitrogen source that gives it a selective advantage, and then that moves all over the world. So an organism solved this chemical problem. Here's another one that you might have seen recent headlines. Organisms are learning how to eat plastic bottles that we have been dumping into the environment only for 50, 60 years. But they're rapidly evolving, rapidly, not rapid enough for my, for my feeling, but they are rapidly evolving. And then they also think about antibiotic resistance. Nature is solving all sorts of interesting problems in real time. And how does it do it? Nature solves problems because those capabilities are already there. It's like, banked. you are selected for your ability to organize these marvelous meetings. But I bet you could also dig ditches if you had to, right? <laughs> you have multiple capabilities, any of you. You know, you may be selected as students for your ability to work long hours in the laboratory, but you can also play the piano. Enzymes are just like that. Enzymes have multiple capabilities that are they're not being used, perhaps, in the biological world at a given time. But when a new opportunity arrives and arises for it to take over, it is there and poised to do it, such that this new activity becomes beneficial and can be optimized through this random uphill walk process that I just explained to you. So students, you think you are working on the internet of things. This is the ultimate internet of living things. Gazillion organisms out there working 24-7 to solve new problems. Let's use that process. All right, so let me move. How do I breed forward novelty? How do I create a new enzyme? Well, a good place to start is in a family of enzymes that's done that many times. Uh, here, here's my favorite family, the P450s. You have 50 in your own bodies that are your first line of defense against various noxious things that you can put in your body. They detoxify by sticking oxygen into uh, different places of those molecules. And this enzyme family has gone through mutation and selection not only to be optimized for different functions, but to have different functions. They catalyze a whole slew of reactions that make them quite admired, even, even by human chemists, because they can insert an oxygen into an unactivated CH bond. They can do epoxidation, sulfoxidations. They can even nitrate aromatic residues. This is, this is really powerful chemistry, and it's come through this process of uh, building on novelty that's already there. So here's how we thought about the problem. In the presence of what you find in the biological world and natural selection, nature took this 
highly active oxygen intermediate that, and I won't go through all the mechanisms because this isn't the right uh, appropriate audience to do that, but nature builds up very active intermediates and has then taken these and diverged through divergent evolution, created all these enzymes that I mentioned for these different chemistries. So if I want to breed new enzymes, perhaps we could expand this collection of reactive intermediates using known human chemistry. And then I provide a new niche in the form of synthetic reagents that drive the formation of these new intermediates. And I use directed evolution to optimize that. With that, I could be able to make enzymes that catalyze reactions that are not known in the biological world, but may be known to humans. So here's a good example. If you have a double bond, a carbon-carbon double bond, humans have figured out that this carbene intermediate can be uh, used to form cyclopropane. So you have this three-membered ring. Or you could insert it into like a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. That, that would be really interesting chemistry because nature doesn't do that. So here's the question. Can this protein, a protein from this family that has an iron inside of a heme, a nice active iron, can it form this intermediate? There was some evidence already that it, we knew it could form, but then instead of transferring it to itself and chewing itself up, this is highly active stuff, could it transfer it to a second substrate and could that evolve? So we ask that question because remember the novelty is already there. These inter, uh, the carbene uh, precursors aren't there in the biological world, so nature never had a chance to say, yes, I can do it. But in fact, if you take something like styrene and this uh, carbene precursor and add it to various heme-containing proteins, you find that they all have a little bit of activity. Even free heme will do it in water. Nobody ever asked because it was a stupid question, I suppose but it has, a, has a, a little bit of activity, and so does another protein, cytochrome C, myoglobin. And my P450 has a terrible, terrible, terrible little bit of activity. But remember, for me, that's the fuel for evolution. If I see a little bit of activity, I'm jumping for joy because I know that I can improve that through evolution. And in fact, if you make one mutation, so you take one of its amino acids and mutate it for another one, its activity goes up 60-fold. And this is what makes chemists really happy, is if you can take something like styrene and EDA, which can make four possible products, and when chemists do it, they get all four products usually, this enzyme only makes one. It only makes one of those. And if you find other mutations, you can also improve the activity and make one of the other products. And this one turns out to be very difficult to make, the cis uh, diastereomer of these, of these cyclopropanes. It's really hard uh, to make that with small molecule catalysts. Now, I told you I bring it to life. So I want this enzyme, which is just encoded in a DNA sequence, to work inside of a cell. And if you noted, some of the chemists in the audience might note that I have things like dithionite there. That's not remotely compatible with a living cell. You melt your cells with that reducing agent. So we had to do a little bit of thinking. I, I try not to contaminate my evolution experiments with thought, but every once in a while, it's beneficial to do that. Every P450 on the planet, as far as, except for the ones in my laboratory, have a cysteine, a sulfur atom here. But these are so beautifully gated that inside the cell, they won't be reduced to this active form unless we provide a strong reducing agent. They're really clever. They're very beautifully tuned and gated to bypass my wishes. But we argued that if you replace this cysteine with something like a serine with an oxygen there, we might be able to drive it with whatever reducing agent is inside the cell. And People said, oh, you know, that, it, that'll just kill it. And in fact, it was well known that if you make that mutation, because every cytochrome P450 has a sulfur there, and if you put an oxygen, it, it's no longer a cytochrome P450. It doesn't have any activity. Well, in fact, it turns a sickly green. My original protein is this beautiful red. It turns a sickly green, and everybody knew that. And it's not even a P450 because it now absorbs at 411 which makes me the mother of the P411. Everybody thought that was useful, useless, but it turns out that's the best cyclopropanation catalyst, or one of the very best that's ever been reported. 
inside of a living cell. So you just use E. coli to catalyze this reaction. You get 70,000 turnover numbers. You get the cis product, beautiful in antioselectivity. As it, and it's just happy as can be to catalyze that reaction. This is a very special enzyme, it turns out. And, and you know, it's hard to convey this if you don't have the love of some of these molecules, but I'll tell it in my words. This new enzyme, which everybody thought would be dead, and it's not dead, it's just waiting for you to ask what it can do, also can transfer nitrines. So this looks a little bit like that, which looks a little bit like that. And, we, and there's a vast literature of small molecules that can catalyze the transfer of this nitrogen and insert that into different places in molecules. And, and only the P411 has this new activity. And in fact, a couple of uh, postdocs in my group showed that you can make an enzyme that does direct CH emanation intramolecularly so that it chooses to react with one of these CH bonds versus another. When you have two next to each other that differ in their, in their bond strength so much, with human chemistry, we're still learning all the rules, you always go to the weak one. And in fact, it was easy to find an enzyme that would do the same reaction that a human can do. But what's really wonderful is that you can use this process of evolution and accumulate mutations around the active site that now give you the six-membered ring, that now give you reaction at the strong bond that's right next door. And that's really impressive. That's, that's what gets us excited, because now we can talk about really selective chemistry. It, to do this intermolecularly, when you bring two substrates together, is really hard, because you have to do this reduction, and then transform the nit nitrine and then transfer that to a second substrate. And we have to do that at the same time that you've got electrons around, and this uh, reaction is very much favored. So all we are doing uh, with most of these proteins is burning money. Uh, that's what this, this is a feudal cycle of burning money, and every once in a while it can transfer it to another substrate. But if you find a little bit of activity, you can evolve that and reshape the active site so that this now becomes preferred over the burning money route. And in fact, we showed that you can get intermolecular sulfamidation, so you can add nitrogen to a sulfur, you can form these three-membered nitrogen-containing rings, and just now we've done direct CH amination. None of these reactions are known in the biological world, but synthetically, they're very useful. So you can think of now a protein, so we look at it with a whole new set of eyes. We look at this heme protein as a self-assembling, DNA-encoded, tunable catalyst, right? It's an iron-containing catalyst, and you can just tune this active site by mutation to do all sorts of interesting chemistry. And this can be very useful. So we tuned uh, a P450 to make, in one step, the core to an FDA-approved drug. You get beautiful selectivity, one step. Here's another example, beautiful selectivity to make the key intermediate to Berlinta. And we care about this because you have a single biocatalytic step done at room temperature in aqueous solution that replaces five or six chemical steps, most of which require precious metals. And environmentally, this is just not a sustainable way to make these drugs. This is our biocatalytic route is very attractive. I'm going to end my little story with one last one, a recent story that you might even have seen, given the, the press, um, the way that the press jumps on science. Think about silicon. If you're a chemist, maybe you've wondered why life does not incorporate silicon into its organic compounds. We find no carbon-silicon bonds in biological systems even though it's the second most abundant element on the planet, on the crust. What's the first most abundant? Any of you know? What's it? Oxygen, and because it's tied up in silicon. There's a lot of rocks out there, guys, and it's all tied up in that. But there's no carbon-silicon bonds in biological systems. And, you know, why is that? Silicon just sits under carbon in the periodic table, Yes, it has different properties. It's an interesting question. But nature has not made enzymes that forge carbon-silicon bonds. Or has she? 
Well, chemists use silicon, everything from silicones, you know, sealants and lubricants, and then chiral compounds show up in catalysts and ligands and a number of interesting areas. Human chemists have been making carbon-silicon bonds and using them for different purposes. Why couldn't biology make that? Well, if you look at the history of human chemistry for this, it's a relatively um, untouched field. There are a few catalysts reported that go through this carbene insertion into an XH bond, into the SIH bond. And it's got a long history. Notice there's no iron. Iron has never been reported to catalyze this reaction. And look at the activity. This is called total turnover number. It's the number of times a catalyst turns over before it stops. And 50 times is not very big. We get nice selectivities. It can choose what product to make, but the activities really are pretty pathetic. A lot of these work at minus 80 degrees centigrade. So we wondered, could you find an enzyme that has activity for this? Well, the answer is indeed yes. We have a vast collection of heme proteins in my refrigerator at Caltech, and we just go and test, and when we find a little bit of activity, we're jumping for joy. Well, it's not hard to find activity for forming carbon-silicon bonds. In fact, many heme proteins have this, and the one I like most comes from a thermohalophile, a bacterium from hot springs in Iceland. It is so stable, look at that, it melts at 100 degrees centigrade. Anybody tells me that proteins aren't stable and they're not good stable catalysts, you can autoclave that puppy. That thing's like a little rock. It's, it's a little protein too. And it has no catalytic activity. It's, its native function is electron transfer. But if you think too hard about things, you wouldn't go and test it. In fact, if you, it, its crystal structure was known, and it's sitting there, it's got a histidine coming up from the bottom, and it, it's got a methionine at the six axial link. So there's no free, there's no water there, no place. In fact, if you do a calculation on the active site volume, zero, right? So if you thought about testing this for catalysis, your, your professor would say, oh, that's dumb, you know, don't test it. But in fact, we just tested, and it turns out that has remarkable activity because that catalyzes the reaction 40 times, just the native protein. And look at that, 97% EE, enantioselectivity. That's a remarkable <laughs> result just for a native protein. And it does it if you provide these synthetic reagents. So it has no active site, but does it very well. And in fact, when you do the directed evolution now, modifying residues, this methionine that, that occupies this six ligand and this, these other residues that sit in the active site, you start making mutations to that. You can accumulate benefits so that now we have catalysts that do this reaction thousands of times before they give up. Much better than any human has been able to, to do in this. And in fact, you can make, and, and you don't, <laughs> the, the point of this slide is to show you can make dozens of compounds. We, we reported in the paper last year 20 new organosilicon compounds, 19 of which had never been described before, which of course made arguing with the referees uh, problematic. And we had an SI that was a supplemental information that was about 1,000 pages long with all the NMRs. But I'll just point out some amazing things about this enzyme. Look at that, there's a double bond there. And I just told you that if you add carbene precursors, you should form cy cyclopropanes. Or in fact, if you add carbene precursors, you can insert into an NH bond. Well, when you've evolved, and the wild type enzyme, the native enzyme you scrape from your shoe, will do a mixture of products. But when you evolve it for silicon carbon bond formation, you get only this product you get only this product. It learns how to bind the substrate in its active site to make exactly what you want and nothing more. And that's what's amazing about the, bio, the world of biological chemistry. We can get away from processes that make dozens of products or even two products, one of which you don't want, because now we can make exactly the products that you do want. And if you look at how this problem was solved, you realize design is a long ways away. We have the uh, very good resolution crystal structure, and we find that those three mutations have completely remodeled this loop that sits over the active iron atom, completely remodeled it. Very difficult to explain. 
And it's, of course, carved out. So if you roll a little ball over the active site on your computer, you can, car you can see that this mutations has now carved out an active site into which these silanes can fit and the chemistry can be done. All right. So, ah, and it works inside of living cells. So we showed that if you put this, it's fully genetically encoded, nothing fancy about it, no new metals, nothing like that. You just rewrite the DNA with these three mutations and put it inside a bacteria, and they will do this chemistry very happily for sugar. So you just feed them sugar, and they'll, they'll do chemistry for you. And that may annoy some chemists who are working really hard in the laboratory to do this, that a bacterium will do it for sugar, but I would argue that that's really the future of the chemical process industries, at least for some of these very high-value molecules. When we, and I'll finish here, when we told this story uh, before the paper was published, um, I, I couldn't talk to the science reporter that was sitting in the front row, and after my talk, he jumps up and says, oh, tell me about this and that, and I said, no, I, you know, I can't tell you because I want to publish it in science. So he wrote a story and made it up entirely. There were so many things wrong with this story, but it made it all over the world because, I don't know if you recognize, that's Dr. Spock and Captain Kirk looking for the Horta, so that's the life inside of rocks. They got it all wrong. I'm not looking for life inside of rocks. I want to put rocks inside of life, so they got it completely wrong. I want to put silicon inside of life and start exploring now with this what happens when you make silicon-containing lipids or you make silicon-containing proteins? How do they behave and what, where can you go if you can build new forms of life? So the ideas are really very simple. And this is the great thing about chemistry today and, and manipulating the biological world. We now have tools and processes that allow you to go out and explore things that are well beyond where nature would ever care to go, but that can truly solve human problems. And by thinking a little bit about how nature solves the problem, we can now expand, expand this space into new reactive intermediates and lots and lots of interesting new chemistry. So I have a number of people in my group who are sitting there thinking, wow, can I do this, can I do that? And I think we'll see an explosion of new chemistry that can be catalyzed by the bi bi biological world. And this powerful design process of, of evolution doesn't just optimize, it also innovates. New species come up, new catalysts come up, whole new solutions to problems come up, and that means we can marry this with human creativity. With 200 years of wonderful chemistry, we can now marry this and solve important problems. It's a fun place to be. So I'll thank the young people who did all of this work. I get to go around and talk about it, but it, it excites me to see this creativity that pops up, and, and uh, I hope that you, you get some inkling of where the future can go. And thank you for your attention and for having me here.